Now, allow me to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Lorkey Liberidian, who will speak about COVID-19 in the sister cities, Cambridge and Yerevan. We are excited to have Dr. Liberidian here with us tonight because she has the knowledge and expertise as a doctor about both communities and their environs. Dr. Lorkey Liberidian graduated from Yale School of Medicine and completed a combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Rochester, New York. She currently works at Cambridge Health Alliance, where she is a physician and sees patients of all ages and is the medical director for performance improvement in primary care. She completed a fellowship in innovation supported by the Gold Foundation. Her work and research interests include improving chronic disease management, as well as pediatric well care and vaccination. She is an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Liberidian's experience in healthcare in Armenia spans several decades. Her work in Armenia has focused on education and training of family medicine residents, as well as practicing primary care physicians using group and problem-based participatory methods. She has presented and lectured at numerous conferences in Armenia. This past year, her work in Armenia has focused on healthcare worker trainings related to COVID-19, as well as working with public health and mental health initiatives related to events of the past year. Before turning over things to Dr. Liberidian, I want to mention that she will be taking questions the way to ask a question is to type it into the chat function of Zoom at any time during her presentation or during the dedicated question and answer period at the end. Your questions will likely be answered at the end of the presentation. Now, please um, welcome Dr. Liberidian. Thanks, Roxanne. Um, I'll also say that I grew up in Cambridge and still live in Cambridge. So uh, I definitely feel like a Cambridge resident and I'm honored to be here both talking about my home, both of my hometowns, actually, since I consider Yerevan home as well, but these are the two cities in the world that I would consider home. I uh, was thinking about this presentation and uh, was very honored to be asked to give it and thought this is really about a journey, um, the journey that everybody in the world has been on. Um, and for this talk, it's really about Cambridge and Yerevan. So what I'd like to do is walk you through the journey of the people of these cities. I mean, we talk about Cambridge and we talk about Yerevan, but the reason they're important is because of the people in these cities, not the structures, but the people who live in them. Uh, in doing so, in walking through this journey, I'd like to highlight the commonalities and the differences along the way. And I think a, by doing that, we'll be highlighting the shared humanity that this pandemic has brought out. Um, and the realities of, of being human in this pandemic. And then I wanna take a brief look at the coming months. So I, I talked about the people, but these are the uh, city halls of both cities. That's uh, obviously Cambridge on the left, that's Yerevan on the right. Um, and in before starting, I wanna give just a little bit of background. Um, I like numbers, I like data, I know not everybody does. But I think it's useful to have this uh, in just in the back of your mind, just general numbers when we go through this. So Yerevan is about 1 million people. The official population of Armenia is almost 3 million. So about of the third of the population of Armenia lives in Yerevan. To be honest, uh, there are probably many fewer than 3 million in Armenia, but 2.9 is the official estimate. There are about 40 hospitals about 10 and a half percent of the population in Armenia, the data for Yerevan doesn't exist, are greater than 65. 98% um, of people who live in Armenia are Armenian and about 26% live below the poverty line that is defined in Armenia. In Cambridge, we have about 119,000 people and in Massachusetts, we have about 7 million. So the size of Yerevan is a, by population is approximately 10 times the size of Cambridge. We have two main hospitals, but obviously we live in a, the greater Boston area, which has many different hospitals. 12% um, of the people in Cambridge are older than 65. We have a multicultural or multi-ethnic population and about 12.7% 12 12 of people live below the poverty line. 
Um, and the population of Armenia is almost 30 times that of Cambridge. And the reason I'm giving that is just because while we have really great data for Cambridge, we don't always have really specific data for Yerevan. So I'll we'll be showing um, potentially both sometimes. Uh, for those of you who love graphs, this might be a great slide. For those who don't, that's okay. I just want you to look at the general lines. And what you'll see is that in the top two graphs, these are the cases in the US, okay? And the cases on the left and then the deaths on the right. And as we remember, it was kind of spring when we had our first surge and then it was the fall that we had and then into winter that we had the second. And then we recently came out of one in our spring. And this at the bottom, this large one is the daily confirmed cases in Cambridge. So that's exactly what we experienced in Cambridge. March, April, May were pretty, pretty difficult. And then with Thanksgiving and the holidays, uh, we went into a pretty significant surge. And then we just came out of a little one as well. In Cambridge, as of yesterday evening, when I updated the data, there were a total of about 123 deaths in Cambridge from COVID during this pandemic. And notice the start is right around March. In Armenia, you'll see a slightly different but not unfamiliar pattern. So started a little bit later, we had one surge and then you'll see this big peak in November. And the one on the left, this is all of Armenia now, not Yerevan. Uh, the, there's a big peak in November and we're gonna get to that. And then you'll see that they recently just came out of a, a surge as well. And the deaths follow a similar pattern. The total COVID deaths as of two days ago were 4,463 deaths in Armenia. Uh, if we think back to just a slide or two ago, if we said the population of Armenia is about 30 times that of, the, of Cambridge and Cambridge had 123 deaths, 123 times 30, if it was gonna be proportional, were, would be 3,690. And yet it's 4,463. So significantly more deaths per the same population number in Armenia than in Cambridge. Um, in Armenia and the United States, if we just juxtapose these two, just to get it visually, you see exactly what those of you who might be uh, visual would expect. The red or maroon line is the United States. It starts first, Armenia follows suit with the green line. And I apologize if you're red, green, colorblind. Um, Armenia then follows with a surge in November, which we'll get to. And then we have the big surge in the US around the holidays and then the smaller surge in the spring in both countries. And the deaths have a very similar pattern. So I wanna take us back to the very beginning. Um, I actually remember being in clinic and watching what many of us might've been watching back then, which was the Hopkins World Data. And Biogen had a conference, if you remember, in uh, the Marriott Long Wharf at the end of February. And we said, this, this is not good. Uh, and soon after that, uh, several weeks later, we really started going into our first surge, but that was a super spreader event. And I think it was an article in the, might've been the Boston Globe or an article somewhere where there's an estimate that maybe 400,000 cases around the world came from that super spreader event. Um, maybe those cases would have happened anyway. It is a pandemic, but when we talk about the source or events or mitigation, how do we prevent these things? That's something that I think many of us will never forget. Interestingly enough, in Armenia, we also had these super spreader events. And the init in init initially, the about 70% of the initial cases, it is thought, came from two main events. One was a woman who was returning from Italy who hid her symptoms and then went to an engagement party in the, in the, in the village of Echmiadzin. Uh, many, many people were infected from that. And there was also an outbreak uh, or the sore source in a factory in Yerevan. So it's very interesting that both cities were able to identify a, a source. These obviously were not the only sources, but there were significant super spreader events. <clears throat> so then as we go through the pandemic, we a lot of terms that nobody had ever heard or thought of became very familiar to many of us. So I kind of want to just give you a general narrative of these, and this is gonna sound very familiar. I'm gonna talk about Cambridge first, uh, and then I'll talk about it with Yerevan. So, we had obviously a lot of things happen very quickly in Cambridge and in Massachusetts. We had seen what had happened in Seattle. We saw what was happening in New York City. We knew it was coming to us. So we, there were a lot of conversations between healthcare systems and providers. So we kind of knew that we were gonna have to shut down. 
And that's exactly what happened. Uh, we started talking about quarantine and isolation. So if you have COVID, you can't be around anybody. If you're a possible contact, you have to be quarantined. What does that mean? Health systems started talking to their providers, their clinicians and their patients about it. We started seeing um, Massachusetts had a plan for closing and for opening, and we, this started becoming part of our everyday language very soon. Uh, if you come into Massachusetts, then you have to quarantine. If you leave for more than 24 hours and you come back, you had to test. Um, the, all, of this, all of these went through different fluxes, but it became normal for us. Schools and businesses shut down. Um, I remember being able to go into Porter Square and I could go into the liquor store to buy a bottle of wine, but I could not go into Porter Square Books to buy a book, which was a very interesting reality, which we only recently have been able to come out of. But it, it, there were some very interesting decisions that had to be made. Um, and that was true around the world. And we saw that in that little microcosm of Porter Square. There were limitations on gatherings, how many people can come together. And that had a significant effect on people. And uh, we know on the, on the psychosocial aspect of COVID, everybody started talking about masks, right? And in the beginning, it was very difficult. A lot of people didn't want to wear them. What kind of mask? How often do you have to change it? Is this okay? Do we have a mask? How often do you have to wash it? Is it an N95? Is it a real N95? We talked about social distancing and hand washing. There was a run on alcohol and alcohol wipes. People were buying vodka in case they ran out of alcohol. Um, and contact tracing was a really significant um, factor that we used uh, or a mitigation tool that we used in, in Cambridge and in Massachusetts. Um, and of course, flatten the curve, stop the spread. These things were things that we talked about throughout uh, the pandemic and we still do. Um, and this, th these realities became part of our everyday life. We had signs. I remember uh, going by Danahy Park and there was a, um, the yellow, you know, do not cross uh, tape around it. Um, and we had to tell our kids, the playground is sick. The playground is sick, you can't go in. You know, and it was a really sad reality for us. Um, it took us a while to get information right and communication right. It's still very difficult. difficult. Um, there are always different sources. There's misinformation and disinformation. And of course, not so much in Cambridge, uh, because as people often say, it's the People's Republic of Cambridge. But at least in this country, um, there were a lot of politicization of the pandemic, a lot of criticism and using it as an opportunity for criticism rather than unity. And of course, the issue of equity came up. Some of us were lucky enough to be able to work from home, but not everybody can. Um, some people had to stop working because they had to take care of their children at home because the school shut down. Uh, and that, that divide was not an equitable divide. Armenia actually uh, and Yerevan experienced similar realities, obviously not exactly the same. There was a state of emergency put in almost very early from the beginning. Um, and that state of emergency was extended twice, I believe, into May. Um, something very interesting happened, which we didn't do in the US, which is that there were four main strategies uh, initially that were used. First of all, anybody who had COVID was hospitalized. It didn't matter if you were symptomatic or not. Anybody who was a contact of somebody with COVID was isolated and monitored. Um, Testing was used, um, was one of the main strategies as well, although we're going to get into that. Um, and then hospitals, um, you know, trying to ramp up the hospitals was something, and we're going to get into that as well. But the contact tracing and the isolation was done in a much more rigorous way in Armenia. Um, that was one of their main strategies going forward. But schools getting shut down was something that happened. They opened up temporarily, then they closed right back down as the numbers went up. Same issues with businesses, um, closing of borders. So the border with Iran, the border with Georgia, there was a lot of political and economic discussion around, well, what about do you close it down with Italy? Italy had all these cases. Um, what countries do you close down flights from and what countries do you not? How do you make that decision? These were very difficult decisions where a lot of, there's a lot of politics and economic um, discussion behind that as well. Um, masking, social distancing, hand washing, while there were slow uptake here, they were much slower in Armenia. It was extremely difficult. Many people did not wear masks and it was supposed to be something that was enforced and it was for a short time. Um, 
there were, uh, there were fines for not wearing a mask, but it was ex culturally, socially extremely difficult to wear a mask and socially distance. Uh, for those who don't know, we're a culture who, who kiss on the cheek when we greet each other um, and not doing that is extremely difficult for people. Um, handshaking as well. So the elbow bump just didn't take on the way it did in some places. Um, that actually became the masks and social distancing uh, and limitations on gathering, especially funerals became a significant issue in November. Uh, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit more. So while in, I feel in Cambridge and in the US, uh, but Cambridge especially, we had some fatigue over time, which is normal in Armenia, that uh, we became involved in a war. And that changed uh, the reality for people on the ground, especially with regards to COVID um, and mitigation of COVID. So we'll get into that uh, in a little bit down the line, in a couple more slides. In terms of uh, health system resources and capacity, I'm gonna switch back to Cambridge for a second. Um, healthcare workers um, were re what we called repurposed. So we had people who had not worked in hospitals in a while, working in hospitals, nurses, medical assistants, physicians, uh, other healthcare workers at all levels um, were repurposed to work in the hospitals or, or to do co what we called COVID calls. So trying to keep up with the massive number of tests of patients who are being monitored at home, doing what we call, for example, at CHA community management, um, building the, the infrastructure for all of the testing and the treatment that needed to happen. Um, immediately there were hospital beds um, uh, an increase in the number of hospital beds had to be made available. So that was done and every system did that. Where can we add beds? Where do we have extra vents? Do we have extra vents? Um, and every day that was monitored. We got reports every day of how many hospital beds are there? How many ICU beds are taken? That was something that was really, uh, really important obviously and we were on top of. And luckily we never ran out of beds. Um, some of you may remember that there were uh, hotels or other locations um, where people could go if they could not isolate safely or um, mass sites where people could go and kind of be monitored if they were stable but just could not go home yet. Um, Massachusetts had a pretty, at least our area had a very quick response for that, relatively speaking. Um, PPE, if you remember before the pandemic, nobody knew what PPE was, but suddenly we were counting our masks. We were hide we had to stock our gloves. Um, it was a huge issue uh, for a very long time and it limited how much we could do and how much care we could provide. Did we have enough Purell? Did we have enough alcohol? Did, could we use something else instead? Testing initially was very short order. If you remember getting a test, qualifying to get a test, um, it was just presumed you were considered, if you remember, um, you were a COVID suspect, right? You were, it was suspected that you had COVID, you didn't even get tested in the beginning. We just didn't have enough tests. And what the treatment was, we didn't know. We, we still don't fully know, but we really didn't have a lot of information. Um, luckily, we live in a, in a really, um, high quality medical res and resourced area. So there was a lot of communication between the healthcare systems. We learned this, we learned that, we're trying this. Um, and because we have such um, intrinsic evidence-based medicine in especially the Boston area, uh, we were able to try to provide as best as possible really high quality care to the extent that we could. Beds, oxygen, they didn't really become an issue in Cambridge or the Boston area. We watched them, we were scared, but they didn't become an issue. In Armenia and in Yerevan, it was a really different story. Um, healthcare workers were repurposed, um, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, especially when patients, anybody with COVID was being hospitalized. But we did in fact run out of hospital beds. Initially, uh, the main, what we call the infection hospital or NORC hospital in Yerevan was the one that was going to take uh, all the COVID patients, but then many other hospitals had to start taking COVID patients and they did plan that, but it just wasn't enough. Uh, and patients were sleeping on mattresses on the floor in the hospital. Primary care providers out in the villages were trying to send their patients into the hospital uh, and were unable to because there weren't beds. There was no access. Patients were at home uh, with oxygen saturation. So an, a normal oxygen might be anywhere from 96 or 97 to 100% with oxygen saturations in the 70s or 80s. And all providers could do was say, go stand by the window, open the window and stand by the window. 
um, there just uh, wasn't, there weren't enough beds. Um, and even uh, a number of providers said they would just wait for one patient to pass so that at least another patient could go in to take that bed. Um, like in the US, healthcare workers became very um, burnt out and overwhelmed emotionally. Uh, that was a similarity for both, um, especially if we're talking about the humanity of not only the patients and the families, but the healthcare workers. We did run out of oxygen in Armenia. There was not enough oxygen. So if you had patients on ventilators and you turned someone's oxygen up, or if you had them on oxygen, the oxygen of the other patients fell. The oxygen saturation, there was not enough oxygen. Um, the supplies and PPE was also an issue. Healthcare providers, especially in the villages or the remote areas, uh, had to supply their own. They were given some, but not enough. So they were going to people's homes uh, to care for them without enough PPE. Many patients were also coming into the clinics. So you felt unwell and you were going into the clinic to be cared for by your provider, which as you can imagine, if you remember how hard it was to go see your doctor a couple of months ago or your healthcare team, uh, that was not an issue and people were crowding. It was an issue to see your provider, but going into the building was not something that was, um, it, it was not being controlled very well. So you can imagine that there were events there. Testing was extremely low in number. So while it did improve, especially relative to the fact that it's a low resource setting, um, while in the US now, and for many, many months now, you know, you, you feel like getting tested, you can just go get tested. Um, in Armenia, that is not the case. Uh, testing capacity did increase, but not in uh, any way close to what we have here. Uh, and treatment, like many other issues and many other medical conditions, Armenia is influenced by many countries around the world in terms of treatment. So they would get guidelines from France, from the UK, from Russia, from China, from the US, from Boston, from Los Angeles, from all over the world, uh, from Georgia, from the WHO. So uh, it, it becomes very overwhelming to have many different guidelines and to process all of that. And imagine that through all of this, the resources in the Ministry of Health are taxed because they're getting sick um, or they are overwhelmed and they are not set up to be able to expand to handle the needs of this healthcare system that is being completely overwhelmed by COVID. So conversations about how do you treat um, were, were many, but not aligned. Uh, and that results in, we have patients in Armenia to this day who get a laundry list of treatment, um, maybe one tenth of which is appropriate and some percentage of which might be harmful. Um, it both, it, and without going into too much detail, and too many antibiotics, too much steroid, uh, not enough of this or that. So uh, very, very different and highlighted some of the areas where we already knew we needed to do work in Armenia in terms of the healthcare system. And it just got, uh, it expanded, it, it exploded in terms of highlighting where the needs really are. So the, there was a lot of knowledge, a lot of misinformation and very difficult to communicate to providers who are already overwhelmed, getting called 24 seven on the verge of just collapsing themselves. And now you're trying to give them that much more information. Uh, this picture a colleague of mine took in Armenia when he was there in October. That is a, an oxygen saturation of 82% on a woman. Like I said, normal is 96 or 97 to 100. She did not have oxygen. There was not enough oxygen. Uh, she stayed at 82. <clears throat> this is just a graphic to show you in terms of the relative testing. So these were the amount of tests per 1,000 people. So the actual population number doesn't matter. But what you'll see here is, again, uh, the U.S. is in maroon. And initially, it was pretty tough to get a, vac uh, to get a test. But then it became pretty straightforward. Drive-throughs, Rite Aids. You know, I, for at some point, I thought I was going to be able to go drive through my Dunkin' Donuts and get a coffee and get a swab. Uh, in Armenia, it was not that way. Um, at some point you could pay, it costs the, the unit of, uh, the monetary unit in Armenia is called a drum, and it cost about, um, I think it was about 20,000 drum to get a, uh, 15 or 20,000 drum to get a test, uh, which is about 30 to $40, depending on where you did it. So this is probably the toughest part of this past year. Uh, as if the pandemic were not enough, 
um, there was a war. It was not on Armenian soil per se, but there is a um, an autonomous region which has a long history of being part of um, armed conflict or war. There was war in the 90s. Uh, there had been a ceasefire uh, and then there was war again. Three important dates here. On March 3rd, 2020, the UN uh, asked for a global ceasefire and said, there is a pandemic. If you're in a war, stop. And if you're thinking of starting one, don't. This is not the time, right? Um, and I think that's a really important point there. Armenia did sign that um, ceasefire, but not all countries did. Uh, the war was over what is called Artsakh, and you might have you might have heard known as Nagorno Karabakh. Um, it was instigated by Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan had not signed the global ceasefire. September 27th was when the war started, and this graph is a little vague, but that red arrow is kind of my estimate of where September 27th is on there. Uh, and I'm going to show you an even more detailed, excellent graph in just a moment. It was 44 days. The ceasefire was signed on November 10th. Uh, Araz Chiloyan is a public health uh, specialist from actually the Boston area who is actually now living in Armenia before and working with the Ministry of Health. She put together this excellent graph. And what you can see here is a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, the first confirmed case of COVID was somebody who came uh, from Iran. He was isolated. That was very early on in March. Then there was the Echmiadzin outbreak. That was the one where there was the engagement party um, and somebody had come in from Italy. I uh, was symptomatic, but had not declared it. Soon symptoms, uh, cases started increasing and a state of emergency was declared and went on for a couple of months. It was extended twice, I believe. As you can see, there was a number of restrictions on movement. Uh, they were placed, they were lifted. Um, there was a lockdown, the lockdown ended. Wearing a face mask became compulsory. Um, and then there was increased enforcement of those masks, which is an important point I'll get to. And so by, by late summer, the numbers were going down again. Um, the first peak in Armenia, if you remember from the first graphs and you see here was really the, the June, July time. November 24th, uh, November, I'm sorry, August 27, the start of the war is where you see the red here and the numbers start going up. Now we, we're not gonna prove causality here. Um, the surrounding countries did have similar peaks around this time, but you will see that the red is when there was the war and the numbers really increased around this time. This is a really important quote, I think, uh, by Dr. Hagop Janyan. He's a podiatrist from Armenia who practices in Los Angeles, and he went and he spent time in the war um, as a surgeon. And uh, my purpose here is not to harp on the war, but to think about the effects of war on a pandemic and on the pandemic in Armenia, because th that is something we did not experience here. It is one of the main differences between what we experienced in Armenia and what we experienced in Yerevan and what we experienced in Cambridge. And it really changed the psychology of, of the pandemic in Armenia. Uh, and for those who maybe can't see this, it's his quote says, uh, this was after he returned, I believe he said, there are different priorities in a war zone. A vast majority of patients brought to the hospital had either life or limb threatening injuries. Nobody cared about COVID while these patients were brought in. We were worried about saving their lives, saving their limbs. So he actually got COVID while he was there. Doctors uh, during the war continue to practice, nurses continue to practice and take care of, of patients while they had COVID. And that actually happened in Armenia as well because there just weren't any other providers. There was nobody else to do the work. So as you can imagine, COVID just spread like wildfire. wildfire. When the war ended, uh, and again, I, what I'm trying to get to here is the psychology and the human component of what happened there was significant political upheaval. Um, I was in Armenia at the time, I took the top two photos. Um, and what I wanna point, point out here, what you, what you might be able to see in this top left photo, this is about three in the morning. After the ceasefire was signed, every, um, there were a lot, there was a lot of upheaval, as I said, and people were out in the streets. And what you see in that bright light under that, this is one of the government buildings in Republic Square, is basically a mob breaking into the building. Uh, I did not get any closer because uh, though I don't usually uh, feel uncomfortable in situations, I didn't really feel it was appropriate to get any closer. 
but I can tell you very, very few people out of the hundreds of those people were wearing masks. Um, the picture on the top right is the next day. Uh, there were protests that started and as you can see, the gentleman in the front is wearing a mask and you can kind of see some scattered people wearing masks, but most people are not wearing masks. And for those of us tracking COVID, uh, this was a significant concern. The bottom photo is not mine, I was not there. This is actually before January 6, 2021. This is obviously November 10. Um, the mob had gone into the parliament building and you can see the state of mind that people are in. And this is what I wanna to speak to is, how does COVID matter after this? Uh, you can see some of the police are wearing masks, uh, but just about nobody else is. So really there was a multi-dimensional impact of the war on COVID. Um, volunteers had gone from Armenia to Artsakh to fight. Many of them we think probably had COVID though they might've been asymptomatic and they took the, the virus with them. Health personnel went, they got it there, they spread it to each other, they eventually came back. Families were being shelled and staying in, um, in bunkers that had little to no ventilation for days to weeks. They were then put on buses and brought to Armenia. So not surprising that COVID came as well. Uh, psychologically, we lost, the numbers are not final, about 3,500 to less than 4,000 uh, lives. These are mostly young men and thousands were injured. This was a massive psychological effect on the population. And imagine an entire uh, nation just in grief. I mentioned gatherings before and limitations, funerals. It was bad enough during COVID that funerals continued and people did not wear masks. But imagine now families have lost their sons. You see in this photo, I did not take this photo, there's one woman in the back wearing a mask, but nobody else is. And we know that funerals, at least two cases documented, were super spreader events, but nobody cared anymore. Um, this led to all of this, all of the deaths and the loss led to a lot of instability and a shift in priorities. Um, I'll also add, I forgot to mention that a lot of uh, people who were being used to help enforce masks now had were doing other things related to the war. There was a war effort. So you didn't have people now helping enforce masks. The psychological impact was, and still is, uh, astounding. And it totally, completely changed how people thought about COVID. It just didn't matter. Uh, one thing, another thing also that was different between uh, Cambridge and Armenia is that Armenia has a diaspora. Uh, Armenians around the world mobilized to try to help both during COVID-19, but especially when it was what we ended up calling a war on two fronts, the 44 day war and the war against COVID-19. Um, Many, many people worked remotely, new organizations were formed, no resources, new, new networks were formed, but uh, some of us went to Armenia as well. Um, this is one example of two friends who I made. I've actually never met them in person. They are two amazing women who are psychologists. Um, I worked with them to help. Uh, this was one of the, the projects that we had and did trainings for psychologists and therapists and psychiatrists in Armenia on what's called psychological first aid um, and how to help treat the, the initially at least the mental health issues that frontline staff had uh, as well as soldiers. This is just one example of many, many different projects and types of work that happened. And I'm happy to go into more if people want to afterwards. Uh, COVID-19 vaccination is what we are hoping is the light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm gonna return to my prior format. In Cambridge, what we experienced was something that was not too surprising. Some people, including uh, providers were really eager, but not all providers to get vaccinated. Um, there are issues about trust misinformation and disinformation about vaccines. Um, obviously the politics unfortunately plays into it and the equity of it, this, these discussions around the equity um, and along socioeconomic lines, racial lines that came up during the pandemic continue now during, during, uh, during vaccination. And there are some really amazing conversations that have surfaced, I think, um, and we, we all know during these times, uh, both because of the prior political situation in the United States, but because of the pandemic as well. Um, 
access initially was a huge issue. Uh, and now we have an excess, which is great. It's wonderful to hear, except that it means that we still have a lot of vaccine hesitant people. Um, and there are reasons that they are vaccine hesitant. And there are reasons uh, that many of which are understandable and we need to understand as a city and as a society and as communities, how do we help, uh, how do we move that forward? How do we move those conversations forward? In Armenia, there's even uh, the, the same uh, misinformation, the same disinformation is out there, but imagine it's now also coming from information from Russia, information from all over the world is coming in and it's politicized the same way it was here. Uh, we actually have in Armenia, there are elections coming up uh, in 10 days on June 20th uh, and vaccines are used just like anything else as uh, tools for criticism one way or the other. Um, we don't have the multicultural um, multi-ethnic groups that we have uh, in Cambridge. We don't have those in Armenia or in Yerevan, although there are uh, minorities, but there are there is an equity issue in the city versus the Marzas or the rural areas of Armenia and how do we get care out there? Um, as of, I believe four to six weeks ago, but I might be understating it, the distribution was about 50-50 in the city of Yerevan, which again has about a third of the population of Armenia and the, uh, the rural areas, but I, I'm pretty sure that has changed. Um, access, and we also have multiple different vaccines in Armenia. So while in Cambridge, we have Pfizer, we have Moderna, we did and then didn't and now have Johnson & Johnson, although it's used less. In Armenia, um, there are bilateral agreements as how, how vaccines are coming in. So we, there is some Russian Sputnik. Uh, there is, I think it's Sinovac or one of the Chinese vaccines that comes in. And Armenia is also part of the COVAX, which is the world. We also have a COVAX initiative in the Boston area. This is separate. This is with the World Health Organization. Um, countries around the world have signed up to be part of international system to receive vaccines. And that for the uh, right now is AstraZeneca. So the majority of vaccine in Armenia is AstraZeneca. And for any of you who've been following, there have been similar concerns, not identical, but similar with AstraZeneca as there have been with Johnson & Johnson. Uh, so. There is vaccine uptake, but there, uh, there is a lot of discussion and strategizing about how do we help people get the right information to make the right decision for themselves about the vaccine in Armenia. Um, we have mobile units in the US now and in Cambridge. We also have them in Armenia for vaccination, um, which is really interesting because it's one of those strategies that seems to really make a difference around the world. Uh, but we still have very low uptake. Um, just a little bit of data, because by now you've learned that I really like data. For some reason, this is from the Cambridge site. Um, the data goes from right to left. So uh, what you see, the most recent data is on the left, and it's just over in this chart, 60 something percent of patients have been vaccinated with one or more doses of the vaccine. Going back to equity, though, we do see that there is a um, there is wide variation, and this is this is something that we've all been hearing about in the news in Boston, Cambridge, and in, in across the country is that it is there are different thought different thoughts, different approaches, different concerns, trust um, about different groups in the area. This is all Cambridge, so when we talk about oh you know seventy percent of people have been vaccinated, there are pockets. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done, um, I think in the city and in the country uh, uh, around all of this. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I think we could just say, this, this is not a cause, this is a manifestation of, of some of the issues that we have. In Armenia, um, one of the reasons, uh, it's a very different picture. So one of the reasons I, I spoke about the war is because it had such a large impact on the reality. So the IRI, which is um, a research, a Republican Research Institute in Armenia, uh, did a survey. I think this is now one and a half months old or so, uh, maybe a little bit less. And so the top left is the question is, what is the most important problem your household is facing? The first and second most important problems. And these are spontaneous answers. Um, Notice that healthcare is the fifth one down and 3% of people can name it first, 3% of people name it second. Um, so pretty low. And then when we look at it, what is the most important problem facing our country? So when we're thinking about how do you focus energies, where are people's minds, what, are, what is their top concern? Political instability, the conflict, the government, 
uh, return of captives, so POWs, cost of living, border issues, security, impact of war, migration, poverty, health, COVID, do not even make it on this list. Uh, so it's, uh, it is a very unique situation uh, and very different in terms of uh, the types of concerns that people have in Armenia. I will say, however, is that I was thinking about this, that I think um, there, is a, there are some similarities because of the human condition. Not surprising then that we have, here's the United States vaccine rate and here is the uh, Armenia's vaccine rates. Very, very low, I'm not even sure if you can see it. Looking ahead, I think in Cambridge, we're looking at vaccines, we're looking at equity, we're looking at how do we move forward. Um, and there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of conversations to be had in Yerevan, all eyes are on the election. There's a lot of work being done around the uh, vaccine rollout, but all eyes are on the election right now. I have references for anybody who wants them and questions, and I apologize for going over. <sighs> okay, so I see questions about uh, what did we get right at this point? How do you get more people vaccinated? Uh, why are there healthcare workers who don't wanna get the vaccine? And what would you advise regarding travel to Armenia this summer or fall? What airline is safe and what should one take regarding COVID supplies? Okay. So I think the last question is the easiest. Um, this summer is, I don't know. I'm going in July. Um, I don't know what's going to happen after the elections. Many of us are concerned that there will be another wave if there are protests in the streets. Almost no one is wearing masks. Um, if you wear a mask in the street, people look at you like you've, uh, you have three heads. And um, I've heard that from multiple different sources. In terms of airlines, I, my guess is they're relatively standardized, um, but I, I flew Qatar when I went in November. That one was pretty good. Um, I think they, they seem to be quite safe, uh, safetyness aware. And in terms of COVID supplies, I would take your masks and your alcohol spray. That, I think that's key. Um, and if, uh, you're welcome to email me if you're if you are trying to go and trying to make a decision because um, I'm in frequent meetings with people on the ground and we'll be there. Um, in terms of uh, Isabel Hamill asked, what did we get right at this point? Unfortunately, I didn't see this during the talk. Can you elaborate on? Um, can you elaborate on it? This what this point was, and while you do that, maybe in the chat, the question about how do you get more people vaccinated. Um, so whether it's, I, I don't know if that means in Cambridge or wh whether it's, uh, it's in Armenia, I, this is a very interesting question. So we have to make it, so I think one of the important things is how we ask this question, because I, I'm a big fan of vaccinations, you probably heard in the intro, um, but there are reasons that people don't get vaccinated and we really need to be open to having those conversations. It can be very difficult um, if, if, if people are thinking they're getting a chip put in their arm uh, that's that's a different kind of type of conversation than, you know, this was just too fast. I just it seems too fast to me. And that there's a conversation that can be had there. Um, and I asking the questions of why people don't want to get vaccinated is a really, really good place to start. Um, the the microchipping, I honestly I, I don't really have an answer to except just trying to listen and talking about the, you know, the risks of COVID, the known and unknown risks of COVID, um, the effects of it, as well as um, medically, as well as socially and economically, um, and mental health, as, as we know, there have been a lot of changes, um, a lot of effect on, on all populations from it. Uh, and, and then just being open to having the conversation and making it available. I, I think it must have been on NPR this morning, there were or maybe the other day, there was a great, uh, there was a woman talking about how she had been really, really hesitant. Her family talked to her about it and enough people talked to her about it without pushing her, but just talked to her about it in different ways. And it, the one day it was just in front of her. Um, she got a text and she was like, I'm just gonna do it. Um, and she was happy that she did it. She was nervous, but she was happy. So these mobile units and texting our patients and texting our communities um, is a really good way of, of trying to help encourage the people who have questions to talk about it in a safe space um, and to get the vaccine. I also think that there is, this is a lot of times some, we, have, we do have communities who are hesitant 
because of uh, inequities and injustice inherent in our system and trying to push people to do something because we want them to do it or because we think it's safer for them becomes a band-aid for us and we this should really be an, a doorway to help have those conversations and help solve those systemic issues rather than just doing it because we want them to do it and then walking away again and not solving the underlying issues. Um, so availability, open conversations, but really getting to the root of uh, why people feel that they don't want to get vaccinated. Um, what did we get right? I'm not sure where that was. Nancy asked, what about the emotional impacts of loss due to COVID and or war? Can we send books? For example, picture books dealing with loss that could be used with social workers or psychologists working with children. Um, Nancy, you've read my mind. So I've, I've actually been working with a group and uh, I've found some funding to work uh, with a children's book publisher in Armenia uh, with stakeholders. So pediatric psychologist, a pediatric and adolescent psychiatrist, a pediatrician, um, and a couple of other individuals to actually develop children's books that are developmentally and culturally appropriate to be written by children's books authors in Armenia with illustrators. Um, it's a project I'm working on and we would we found funding for it and then we would use those and create videos to help um, to help uh, show how to best use those books. I'm really hoping this comes to fruition, but we've been, I've been working on it. I have some, some help. Um, and that is something that I talked to about 20, 25 different people in Armenia and they all felt that this was really needed. So I'm happy to connect with you offline. Um, given the number of people who had contracted COVID, how close is Armenia to herd immunity? What is the condition of territories remaining under Armenian control in Artsakh? Um, so herd immunity, it's, it's hard to know about the herd immunity uh, case in Armenia. It's unlikely that we're going to reach herd immunity. Um, it's unclear exactly how many people have had it, though we do know a lot have had it. We do know about um, there are uh, new variants that come. We hear cases. It's interesting. I hear a lot of cases of secondary infections in Armenia, though I don't know that those are truly established or real. Um, to be honest, I haven't had a chance to really dig into that, but I've hear, heard it anecdotally many times now for a long time. Um, I, I don't think it's safe to rely on herd immunity, just like it's not safe here to rely on. We, we probably won't reach it here. Um, the condition of territories remaining under Armenian control in Artsakh. I don't know if you mean COVID-wise. COVID-wise, I, I don't have that data. I don't know if we have that data. Um, uh, but it is, I don't even know if it's being collected. There is so much going on there right now in terms of the condition of the territories. Um, there's a lot of rebuilding to be done in terms of infrastructure, human resources. Um, it, it's, uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of challenges and obstacles. I'm happy to talk about that at some point. Um, I know I went over, so I'm trying to be conscientious, Roxanne. Um, what else in addition to the children's books could a group like CYSCA do to help address COVID in Armenia? Um, I think that's a great question. Um, I had not really thought about that too much ahead of time. I do, um, I'm, I think there are, you know, a ton of ideas are flooding to my head. Um, and I would love to have the opportunity to sit down and, and brainstorm some ideas, especially because I don't know what the resources are and what networks, um, the Sister City Association has right now, but there are probably some, some uh, networking and some conversations that could be had that could be really interesting. One of the first thing that comes to mind is about vaccine hesitancy uh, and some of the questions that came up above about how do we overcome that? And I think Cambridge has been doing a great job. Um, of course I'm biased, but I think Cambridge has been doing a good job in terms of trying to reach out and we can all do better, but maybe we can do better together, not to sound cliched. Um, and can Cambridge as a medical community possibly send medical supplies through what organization? So I don't know that, um, I think that's a really good question. There are a fair number of medical, Armenian medical organizations who are trying to get supplies, who have been sending supplies. We were sending shipment after shipment in November and October and before. Um, oxygen is something that the diaspora has helped um, organize and get a, a new oxygen generator. Um, 
venti masks and different types of, of kits, but the, there, there is an Armenian American Medical Society in uh, Boston. Um, and that would be, if there are supplies that can be sent that are appropriate, we of, of course, we wanna make sure that it's something that's needed. Sometimes there's a mismatch with these types of international efforts, but it, um, the Armenian American um, Medical Society uh, is in close contact uh, with the larger umbrella organization that exists uh, in the diaspora, as well as with uh, connections in Armenia. I think I got all the questions. What did we get right at this point is the one thing that I didn't answer, but uh, I didn't know where it was. We got a lot of things right in Cambridge. Uh, I, I think we did. Um, and we learned a lot along the way. So uh, I, I'm not sure exactly. In Armenia, we got some things right as well, um, but it just became too much. There were definitely some mistakes along the way in both areas, but it just became too much in Armenia. Oh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, I'm sorry to have run over, but um, it's a difficult presentation. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Luberidian, for, for your presentation. I think we all learned a lot and we'd like to continue the dialogue with you after this presentation, talking with you indeed about where we could we could fit in to help. Absolutely. Um, yeah, my mind is now racing with ideas, so mm -hmm. I'm happy to have any discussions with uh, anybody who wants to reach out. So um, you have my email and please feel free to share it. I will. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everybody. I hope you have a good meeting. <laughs>